Hello, everybody, and welcome to our community radio regional Yo. roundtable. Uh, we are doing this as part of Philly Cam's uh, People Powered Media Fest, which started yesterday and will continue on to Friday, uh, November 30th. And this is a whole series of events that, uh, of course, is sort of celebrating community media. If you'd like to find out more about some of those events, you can go on to our website at phillycam.org and look at all of the uh, uh, events that are going to be coming up. We're doing this regional roundtable today for, I think, two important reasons. One is that today is Community Media Day. And that's a day that we take out every year to celebrate the work of public access centers, uh, community radio stations, and low power radio stations across the country. The second reason, I think maybe a little bit more personal, we're doing this because this is kind of like the fourth anniversary of WPPM, our own uh, Philly Cam's radio station. Uh, four years ago, we got this radio station up and running for the first time, and we're really proud of the work uh, that we've been able to do here on this radio station. So uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Keith Brand, and I'm the chair of the radio, television, and film department at Rowan University. Uh, I've been involved with radio for over 20, or almost about 30 years now. 27 years, I was at WXPN Radio in Philadelphia, and lately, uh, I've had my own show on WPPM. Uh, it's called Country Miles. It's a monthly broadcast uh, music show about country radio. Uh, and also, I'm writing a book about uh, community radio stations across the country and the role that they play in their respective communities. So, uh, I've been very interested in community media for many, many years. I'd like to now introduce our panelists. Uh, first is uh, Keish Datz, who is the producer of Hear Us Out, which is our youth uh, media program on WPPM 106.5 FM. Uh, how are you today? I'm really good. Thank you. Good. Thanks for coming and being part of this panel. No problem. Uh, our next guest is Daniel Arista, the station assistant at Radio CATA 102.5 FM in Bridgeton, New Jersey, in South Jersey. Uh, Daniel, thanks for being with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. And our third panelist is Tom Cassetta, uh, the station manager at G Town Radio 92.9 FM in uh, Philadelphia. And in my old neighborhood, lived in Germantown for many years. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for having me. So I want to start off with a question. I think it's sort of a two-parter. Uh, the first part of it is just, uh, I think you can maybe talk a little bit about what you do at each of your respective radio stations. And also, I would like you to perhaps share a little bit of work that uh, you've done on your radio stations. So the question is this. I think the two issues that are most impacting our communities right now uh, are COVID and the election. And I wanted to ask each of you is, uh, how you were addressing uh, uh, those particular issues uh, at your respective radio stations. So maybe we'll start with Keish. You can talk a little bit about that. Yes. So um, the way actually I show... Um, the way our show works is that we didn't have a summer, but we had like the beginning of COVID. <laughs> I always say COVID. Um, and so spring going mm -hmm. into like the earlier um, season. And then we have another season, which actually has a new um, cohort. cohort. Um, so the way that we was addressing it is we addressed like this, the problems that would come mm -hmm. with um, all of this, being in the health, addressing mental health, sharing mental health resources and just things mm -hmm. that, every um, body or things that we felt was necessary um, to be dispersed, resources, and just trying to help everybody out. So that was really how we addressed it. Even now, and today is the first episode of, an, of, of the new season at 5.30. And, and sorry, um, um, and we'll be addressing the election and I'm also addressing um, go, going through school at a time like this. Hold on. So, yeah. 
So the first episode is going to be following this program. <clears throat> yes. Oh, great. Good. Uh, okay, let's move on to uh, Daniel. Uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your station in Bridgeton, and then uh, if you could address the questions of uh, how your radio station is attempting to address these, you know, these two big issues right now. So, uh, with our organization, GATA, the Farm Workers Support Committee, uh, we usually focus more on supporting the, the immigrant community. And that's a group by itself who was also affected by COVID-19. So Gata has their own weekly radio shows on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. through 11 a.m. And we usually talk about how the pandemic affects the immigrant community and how, in what ways we'll be able to support them. And um, we also have a few episodes on how to eat healthy and have a better immune system to you know, fight um, such viruses or to just to keep yourself a little bit more healthier. So it's, it's it, our work can be divided up into a broad um, topic about the pandemic and topics specifically about targeted towards the immigrant community. Great, thank you. Uh, how about uh, Tom, station manager at G-Town? Uh, do you want to talk, tell us a little bit about G-Town Radio and then, you know, how your uh, radio station is addressing some of these important issues? Oh, sure. Well, G-Town Radio um, operates out of Germantown's neighborhood of Philadelphia. We service the Northwest communities here in the city of Philadelphia and the surrounding areas as well. We were an internet radio station for uh, 10 years prior to going on to the FM, which will in January will be our fourth year of broadcasting. So like uh, WPPM, we're very uh, happy to be continuing to do so as one of those stations that helped to service the city of Philadelphia. Uh, one of the things that we did, of course, when the COVID shutdown and lockdown did was, you know, how do you operate a radio station with a skeleton crew and maintain that live freshness going on? And what we did was myself and the program director immediately began a morning show from that we'd air at seven to eight live program. It kind of started out, we would kind of collectively jokingly refer to it as school closings radio. We were kind of reading announcements, talking about what was going on. And then it slowly has morphed into having more guests coming on, sharing highlights that we've had throughout the week on our other programs who are talking about things such as COVID, things that are pertaining to the election and other issues that are pertinent to the community. We also had a program that came soon after that, the Info Hub Hour, which is produced along with a group that uh, you may have heard of, the uh, Info Hub, Germantown Info Hub group. And they are a, a media um, research group. And they do a show every Thursday evening at the hour of five o'clock that's aired. And so those are the two specific pros. One of our other programmers who had a background as a psychiatrist pulled together uh, Coping with COVID, where she just reached out to all of her colleagues and has been producing a series of shows that have been airing. So one of the things that was really exciting was how the staff really came together. They all saw this need and sort of recognized what community radio can be and what its mission is. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of really strong, like sitting down, what do we do? It just sort of organically happened. And it's been exciting to watch it continue to morph. It's uh, great. Thanks, Tom. We're actually joined by our fourth guest today, and I want to introduce him now. Uh, Harmon Carey is the founder of WHGE LP 95.3 in Wilmington, Delaware, and is the president of the Afro-American Historic so Historical Society of Delaware. Uh, Harmon, welcome to our show today. Show today. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm honored to have been invited uh, and I consider I'm the kind of the baby. I'm the old man of the group, but I'm the baby of the radio stations. So thank you so much uh, for uh, this invitation. And thanks for joining us today. I'm going to ask you the question that I've asked the other panelists so far. Yes. Uh, how has your radio station addressed uh, 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 one of the important topics in the community, obviously, is COVID. So uh, I'm... Uh, I'm curious about how your radio station has addressed this issue. Well, um, there are here in uh, Wilmington, uh, uh, which has a majority African-American uh, population, 60%, uh, uh, so it's, it's about 60,000 people here in 
total when uh, 60% are, are African American and all of you guys and lady or ladies know that uh, we, we as a people are disproportionately affected uh, by the COVID uh, virus. So we, we take it very, very seriously. And uh, among the things that we do is on each program, we announce uh, the COVID testing sites as well as other uh, supportive or resources that people can take the advantage of in the, in the community. On every program, we do that. And, and sometimes more, more than once because people have to be reminded or if you're giving out a phone number the first time around, they may not have a pen. So we, we, we stay with it. Uh, okay, I want to come back to this in a little bit. And, and uh, uh, Tom, you even kind of started to answer this question. But uh, before I ask you to share some work of your radio stations, uh, y'all, uh, everybody knows that the election is in two weeks. The second part of my first question is how, uh, how or if we're, uh, you were addressing uh, the upcoming election uh, at your radio station. Uh, let's start with uh, let's start with Daniel. So at the moment, the only method we are to informing our members is through community meetings. Um, it, it's it's a little bit difficult to talk about it with our community, mostly because um, some people aren't don't don't have the privilege in order to vote, but would still like to be informed. So we do these by attending and hosting community meetings in which anybody can come in and join and know a little bit more about what's going on and how the results may affect them. Uh, Keish, how about with our youth uh, media radio project? Are you addressing the upcoming election with the students in your uh, in your group? Yes, we are um, addressing the election um, um, through radio both non in a bipartisan way, um, not bipartisan, nonpartisan way. Um, but the way that we're addressing it is really through social justice issues and trying to um connect people to issues that we feel that that are important. Um, and tied to human rights and human connection, so that they can be more um drawn in to want to vote. So yeah, um, we are addressing it. We're doing it more so on a human rights um and talking about issues that that we feel are really affecting us as a community. Uh, uh, Harmon, how about you in, at your radio station? How has the, uh, upcoming election, uh, uh, how has your station been addressing that? Well, uh, let me, um, uh, before answering your question, a answer a question that you didn't ask. And that is that we got involved in voter registration, um, shortly after the death of, uh, John Lewis, we formed, uh, an organization, and I don't know whether you can see this or not. Let me see. I guess can you can you can you see this? We formed something that we call the John Lewis Voter Education Project, and it, its objective was to, uh, in the first phase, was to get people registered. And we actually conducted voter registration from the green room of our radio station. And we uh, collaborated with several other uh, groups in the community so that um, I, we were able to promote their uh, voter registration efforts as well as those that were being uh, sponsored uh, by our organization. Uh, the second thing that we're uh, that we've done and are doing, uh, we uh, present a program, a uh, weekly program, the Political Power Hour. And our host invites those uh, candidates who are running for or who are currently um, holding uh, uh, seats in government, uh, uh, and uh, we have them tell our listeners why it is 
that they should support uh, why they de feel they deserve to be uh, in office and how they can best represent uh, our community uh, citizens. It, it's a one hour program. And um, uh, sometimes we have to stretch it to two hours if we have uh, more than one guest. The political power hour, we call it. The political power hour, great. Uh, Tom, how about G-Town Radio? We've been uh, really doing a lot of voter information uh, through PSAs, through various guests that we've had. We've tried to look at the spectrum of the shows that we have on, and we've had people talking about the voting issues on how to vote, ranging in terms of a vast socioeconomic terms of guests. We've had uh, youth initiative voting down to people who are in their 70s and senior care voting. So we've kind of tried to talk on all of that. And it, pertaining to like issues that are coming up in the election, a lot of our programmers had continued to kind of carry for that to shows that we have. We have shows that deal with the climate, specifically the LGBT community is one of racial justice, economic inequality. All of these are constantly issues that are still politically charged issues. So there's constantly guests that are coming through the community that represent what's going on and kind of sharing that and spreading the information out. Uh, great, thank you. So uh, I believe we have a couple of examples of uh, work that some of your stations have done. So I'm gonna ask, uh, I'll start with Keish. Uh, why don't you give us a little introduction into the piece that you're going to share and uh, then play it and we can get an example of what you've been doing with the Youth Media Project. Yeah, so the, the clip that you're about to see is actually one of like our first tests with like trying to move everything online. So that was like just a fun experience in itself and it's surrounding mental health um, through COVID and everything. So yeah. have an opportunity to take a break. There are ways that we can get reliable information about COVID-19 updates. You can sign up for the city of Philadelphia's text messaging and email alerts, and they even have an app where you don't have to connect directly into the news all the time. You can wait until you get a text message to see any pertinent updates that you need to know or that the city feels like you need to know. Um, and I subscribe to those updates myself because I don't want to overwhelm myself with all of the information that's coming through. Yes, um, I do have a question about, you made a good point about access and I feel like in a black community, yeah, when we, we don't have access, um, but when we do have access, mental health is really a taboo. And I really want to um, ask the question of, I see in my family, people will deny signs or um, if you have, live with an older person, they have something like Alzheimer's or early signs of that. How do you convince the person to go to therapy when it's like, it's a really taboo topic? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And you're absolutely right. Um, in communities of color, especially the black community, um, we do still have a lot of stigma around mental health and getting the help that we need. I would certainly say that you can use other people as an example. So um, I know that um, there are a lot of people that have certain opinions about celebrities, but if there's someone that you're talking to that has an attachment to a specific celebrity and they have come out to say that I have a therapist or I've sought treatment um, for a challenge that I was having either recently or in the past, educate them on that. Like, oh, wow, you know, this person saw a therapist. What do you think? I can see that we still have the same buffering issues that I do in every single Zoom class that I have to have with my students. But thanks, Keish. This is really great work. Why don't you tell me, Thank you. Tell, tell me a, a little bit about the age ranges of the kids that are in your uh, youth media project? Yeah, so the age ranges um, are usually, I believe, freshman high school up until the age 22. So there's a broad range of youth. Um, and I know that really the, the age is there because, you know, when you graduate high school, often you are, you, you, you are put into a situation where you have to kind of find opportunities 
that you might have had, but now you can't um assess. So yeah, I really appreciate that. And there's just a wide range, wide range um of ages as far as youth. So yeah. Great. Thanks. Uh, Daniel, how about you? I believe you've got a clip that you want to share with us. Why don't you give us a little introduction to the clip and then we'll, we'll play it. Okay. So the clip is in Spanish uh, one of Gata's branches of work is in food justice. So our food justice coordinator, Katia Ramirez, uh, focused that week's episode on ways someone can use organic products they can easily grow in one's garden and help them have a, a healthier meal or ways they can cook um, homemade remedies if, for medical use or um, using organic products to put in different meals in order to strengthen your immune system. Great, here's the clip. <clears throat> El día de hoy quisiera eh, enfocar un poquito en ese tema como recordatorio de que debemos de ir manteniendo nuestra sana distancia, eh, prevención y todo eso. Y más que nada también en el día de hoy, basado okay? en yeah. mi enfoque y mi rama de trabajo dentro okay. de Cata, quería enfocar en compartir con ustedes algunos uh, remedios, um, ya sea con plantas medicinales, cosas que pueden... Eh, encontrar fácilmente en las tiendas que quizás puedan tener en sus patios um, que ustedes mismos están creciendo o que tengan conocimiento al punto ya a, me, a mediados del programa del día de hoy um, sobre qué cosas se puede comer durante esta pandemia eh, para fortalecer el sistema inmune eh, con comida nutritiva, sana y hecha en casa. Eh, evitar comer alimentos enlatados o con mucha grasa Bolsa de papitas, churritos, refrescos de todo tipo, cosas muy dulce, así como azúcar y sal um, en demasiadas um, o cantidades altas, ¿no? Asegurar que estamos tomando mucha agua, ya sea natural uh, y saborizada o agua mineral, jengibre con limón, naranja, um, miel, eh, una cantidad de fuentes de vitamina C, tales como los frutos rojos, las fresas, las moras, frambuesas, cerezas. Uh, tuvimos fresas en el huerto, ahorita tenemos moras. Um, cítricos como limón, mandarina, naranja. Eso sí, no los podemos ofrecer aquí porque son tropicales. Uh, Daniel, I, I, uh, I'm sorry. You know, I've been studying Spanish for a long time and I'm still not good enough to quite get that word for word. Uh, but this is one of the shows on uh, radio. Is it Radio Cata? Radio Cata, yes. Radio Cata. Uh, and the subject was uh, uh, how to eat more healthy, how to eat organic products, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, great. We actually have another uh, clip to share. Uh, Harmon, do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Give us some context, and then we can uh, take a look at this. I think this is a PSA about COVID. Yes, it, it is. Um, and we uh, thought that sometimes uh, our listening audience might pay more attention to our PSAs that they were presented by well-known uh, officials in the city. So we invited Velda Jones Potter, uh, the first African-American city treasurer, uh, to um, I record a PSA, and uh, I think that's uh, what you have uh, that you're going to play. Tell Great. Joe Potter. Great. Let's listen. Hello, Wilmington. This is your city treasurer, Velda Jones Potter. As you know, here in Wilmington and across this country, African American communities are among the hardest hit by the coronavirus. And we've got to do everything we can to keep each other safe. Even if you are not showing any symptoms, you can still spread the virus to others. So here are a few things we can do to stay safe. Stay home when you can. Avoid large crowds and small gatherings, especially indoors. Maintain six feet from others in public and wear a mask covering both your nose and mouth. 
Together, we will defeat COVID-19. Thank you, and may God bless. Thank you. Uh, so I want to, uh, I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. Uh, obviously, uh, the current pandemic is a major issue that we're all dealing with. Uh, we're, you know, all of us are community radio stations and we rely on volunteers in order to staff our radio station. So I guess I want to come back to this and maybe I'll come back to you, Tom, because you talked about this a little bit before. Uh, how has COVID impacted your radio station, not only in terms of the programming, but just in terms of, you know, we rely on the, uh, we rely on our audiences to help fund the radio station. We rely on volunteers to help run the radio station. So uh, this could impact different radio stations in different ways. So let's talk a little bit about how uh, um, G-Town Radio has uh, been able to weather this pandemic. I mean, it, we'll start with talking, you know, the first thing is funding. And, you know, I think that in our case, we've, you know, had to really be resourceful, look at different ways that uh, grants and really kind of push ourselves to be able, we've been lucky to be able to, you know, receive some additional funding from sources that we hadn't had in the past, which put us in good shape prior to the pandemic hitting. But we've yet to really know that impact in terms of our volunteers' ability to support the state and as well as our community uh, because, you know, the year is not over. Usually a lot of our uh, support comes toward the ends of the year. So this next quarter is sort of that time we find out how that works. But beyond the economic aspect in terms of our programming and the community's um, response to it, we've seen a more of a response from our community that they're listening more. I don't know if it's because they're home more or they've been able to find out or we're just something that is sort of uh, the, a welcome alternative from this, you know, the clutter that they're being surrounded with. And here's something that's real. It's not filled with pretense. It's not going after numbers. It's actually someone in my community talking about what's going on in my life. And I can relate to that, be it in terms of information or sometimes that welcome voice in the home of comfort and sometimes just escape. So I think, that has really been something we've seen from the community in response to us during this time. And of course, then there's the internal aspect of how you change your whole aspect of doing radio, uh, incorporating things like, you know, Zoom and different ways to broadcast that. And then, you know, we've all gotten um, crash courses on uh, repurposing equipment and learning how to be technically uh, experiments. And that's sort of one of the best parts, I think, that community radio has the ability to do is we can take kind of risk now and then and try something and hey that worked and you know, you know we have that freedom to do it and that's kind of an that's kind of what keeps us when you get frustrated during this time like oh no you know we, we're having you know latency issues or buffering issues coming on but at the same time some of those things we're doing we can do it and that and we can we're, we're pioneers <laughs> We have to be careful whenever we say the word crash because that, that uh, <laughs> I avoid that one. That, that is something that we may have all uh, experienced at some point. In time. Well, but I want to come to that a little bit and talk to, uh, 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 about successes that you've had. And some of them may be as a result of COVID, but that's going to be my next question. Carmen, how about the WHGELP? Uh, what have been some of the challenges with this pandemic? in terms of your community volunteers, in terms of your funding for your station? Well, uh, let me get to funding. That uh, seems to be at the top of our list in terms of needs and perhaps some of my uh, colleagues who are looking forward on this panel. Uh, we uh, initiated in the fall of last year uh, a monthly event. We called it Third Thursdays. And it was held at a black owned restaurant. And it was really a fundraiser for our organization. But we also used it as a, um, a vehicle or platform to honor uh, certain individuals in the community. Well, our last one was in February and we haven't been able to um, sponsor anything like that since. So uh, in COVID has impacted our ability to raise monies through 
the main uh, source that we had uh, uh, established, and that was a community-wide fundraiser and tribute to certain leaders in the community. Um, we also lost some of our hosts who felt uncomfortable about coming out. Thanks to Paul Bain and Peter of Prometheus, uh, we were able to get a, uh, a microphone with a 25-foot cord on it. So uh, we, using that, we were able to maintain at least social distance for, for, for a guest, and it uh, would, you know, make people feel a little bit more comfortable. So I want to remind everybody that we're listening and watching the Community Radio Regional Roundtable on two platforms, Philly Cam WPPM 106.5 and uh, Philly Cam Community Media. Uh, so Daniel, how about you? Uh, how has your station had to adjust uh, in terms of uh, volunteers and funding uh, due to the pandemic? So when funding, uh, in the terms of funding, we usually have sponsorships, but they usually from local businesses um, trying to support our local radio station. And when the pandemic hit, um, these businesses were also struggling. So it wasn't wise or it was really uncomfortable for us to go out and ask for a sponsorship when such businesses couldn't um, sometimes meet and uh, meet for their own perspective. As far as programming, the majority of our programs are volunteers that people come out to our radio station and do their own programs. Um, and the start of the pandemic, we actually closed down the radio station and we were only playing music at the meantime. So one of my challenges was to find um, new ways of programming and I reached out to a few radio stations, and fortunately, um, two of them, uh, Radio Radio Bilingue and Central FM, were kind enough um, to work with Radio them and we're now able to share their weekday episodes on our radio station. And then I also learned how to remote broadcast, and that led the opportunity of a few people to come back to the radio and do their programs remotely. Great. Uh, Case, you sort of had a different challenge. You're working with youth, and I'm, I'm not sure whether there are, you know, parents were sort of unwilling to let some of these kids uh, work with the youth media project. Talk about how you had to adjust to the uh, pandemic. Well, um, I know Fleet Camp had, um, ended up shutting down, um, and they actually did reopen with limited capacity and for, uh, professors. But the way that we did it was we um, ended up moving everything online. So um, we would live stream on our Facebook, live on Philly Cam's Facebook, and um, we would use their platform. Um, um, the Youth Radio Show would use Philly Cam's Facebook um, and also stream through the radio. Uh, so the way that we just adjusted was just turning everything back online. There wasn't really, I don't know really behind the scenes, if I'm being honest, but the way that we adjust it is online. Can I double dip? Please. Okay. I uh, didn't think of that until I, I heard some of the comments uh, from uh, uh, our panelists. But one of the impacts it had, a direct impact, was on our sports show. <laughs> Uh, we were advertised. We were presenting a weekly sports show, Eddie J's Sports Zone. Well, sports came to a screeching halt, and uh, he didn't have anything to report <laughs> about. So we we, we kind of lost that that program. We we initiated another a uh, sports program of, about two weeks ago, but that was one direct uh, consequence of of COVID. And the other thing I want to uh, uh, add to uh, my uh, comments is that we we had to really go searching for money uh, since we weren't able to generate it on our own. We were we had to end up writing proposals to uh, foundations and other uh, groups that uh, were uh, uh, making 
small, but uh, uh, it was a big help, small grants available. And we wrote these proposals and kept our fingers crossed. And we were fortunate enough to get some funded. And uh, we've just had to make do with what we what we could get. One of the things that I love about uh, community radio, community public access television, is that there are so many good stories uh, coming out of each of our uh, each of our uh, respective uh, TV or, in this instance, our radio station. So uh, I'd like to ask you if you could tell me. Uh, a story or a couple stories about something that really uh, struck you as a real success, uh, perhaps something, you know, a, a moment that you knew that you were really reaching your community. Uh, I'm guessing you all have stories like that. So um, let's go, Daniel, how about you? Uh, are there, do you have like success stories that you'd like to share with us about the work that you're doing in your community? Um, yes, when it comes with the community, since Kata focuses on the immigrant community, um, when the pandemic hit, um, some people had economic relief, but the immigrant community didn't really receive any much help. So what Gata did, uh, we asked for grants in order to have an, an economic relief so we can provide it to our community. And then we also asked for donations where people are generous enough to donate and we can help other families. <clears throat> and when we did that, the support that people came out with was just pretty enormous. Like I was surprised by the amount of people who actually came out and wanted to support our community. So that was really, um, really special to see. Uh, Tom, how about you? And this could be pre-COVID too. You know, things that something that uh, happened at your radio station where you just knew that you were making an impact on your community. Oh, I mean, there's there's a lot of them. So trying to pick one that happens most recently. Um, you know, I'll do one. We're always talking about news and information. I'm going to kind of go to a different aspect, and that's something that kind of hit me. Just most recently, we have a program on that does live radio theater, and it's live. They do scripts, so all the actors are um, are now remote. So it's kind of interesting to have them kind of doing their voices remotely, not in the same room, but doing it live. But at the end of one of the programs, one of the um, actresses made a statement that you know, thank you so much for giving us this platform, because stage is not happening right now. We're not having an opportunity to perform in front of an audience, and you are providing this live response. We're not just reading a script that's being pre-produced like we've done in other things, but we actually have an audience right now that we know is tuning in. And it was very emotional and how she, you know, she was breaking up when she was talking about it. You could feel it was genuine and real. You know, I, I kind of got a little weepy myself hearing her talk about it. So, so that's really where you start to see, especially this time that our life, you know, our local music show, a lot of the arts that is not having a chance to be seen or heard, we have a chance at least, hey, that's still happening, it's alive, in addition to the other things. But you know, there's numerous news shows as well, but that, that's when it just kind of hit and that's kind of out of the normal. Harmon, how about you? Do you have a story to share about something that happened at the radio station where uh, you just had, you know, that that encapsulated the fact that Community media is powerful, and uh, it's engaging the community. And it could be something that happened pre-COVID. Well, a couple of things uh, uh, come to mind, and I'll be uh, very brief. Um, we and I'll preface it by saying we see our radio station as being more than just a radio station. So we we do all kinds of stuff, and because I'm new at it, and I don't have uh, the kind of experience that tells me, well, you shouldn't be doing that. That's not what radio stations do. So we're just uh, we're, we're just outside of the box. And one of the things we did during Black History Month was to pay tribute to two pioneers of Black radio here in Wilmington, the first uh, DJ and the second DJ. Uh, the first one has passed on, but the second one is still with us. He's in his 90s. He was able to attend the tribute. 
and we asked city council if they would um, issue a resolution in his honor. And he went to city hall. I have the, uh, the a copy of the resolution in front of me. It was uh, a resolution signed by all of the city council members. And it, it, it was a good feeling. Uh, he felt good about it. It was the first time he'd ever been recognized. And his family felt good about it. And the community came out. That was, that's one thing. The second thing, and I'll make this one a little briefer, uh, and it was in partial response to the COVID uh, virus situation. We collaborate with an organization called Food Not Bombs. And on a small patio that we erected in the back of our studio, every week we distribute clothing and food to people. We give them hand sanitizers, like so, masks, like so. Oh, you all know what a mask looks like. <laughs> but uh, both of those were, were well received. People come out, they get fresh vegetables and fruit and canned goods and clothing. And uh, a church, a local church has joined our effort. So it's gotten a, a little bigger, but people look forward to it. It's a weekly food and clothing giveaway. Keish, how about you? Uh, you know, it could be something that happened before COVID, uh, something where uh, uh, a story that you could share where, you know, this, uh, I, as a, as a teacher of students, it's sometimes I feel like it's that light bulb moment where you just see like, hey, they're really getting this. Yeah. Um, so there's actually two, but the first one is we got to celebrate moves. Um, I think it was 20 years anniversary um, from everything. And we actually got Pam Africa to come on um, to talk and to do an interview with us. And that was like just big because we at first we didn't think we, that we was going to get it, but we got to celebrate moving. Um, just overall, that show was like felt extremely important. And it, it didn't feel possible um, when we were first um, doing it or just had the idea, but to be able to do that felt just amazing. And then there's usually a show that we put on that is actually in person that's called like the Live Culture Fest Festival where we have different organizations and videos and this everything comes together like an end of the year um, celebration for the, for the show. So we ended up having a switch online and although the show wasn't in person, we ended up connecting with people and just the show still went on regardless. So it just felt like a really good moment and accomplishment to know that although we weren't in person, um, physically everything happened, still happened and still could happen. And we realized that um, move, although we felt like moving online at first was impossible and just felt like out of this out of this world, um, as far as the ability, um, when we was able to achieve um, moving everything online, um, it felt really good because we now know we have like a different platform that we can now use. So that was just big, um, having everybody still come together, different organizations, different young people sending videos and everything, and even celebrating the graduates. So yeah, uh, that was definitely a story, yes. I want to remind everybody that we're listening to the Community Radio Regional Roundtable on two platforms, uh, WPPM uh, uh, 106.5 FM and Com Philly Cam TV. Uh, I mentioned before, and I'm sure you all definitely know this, there is an election in two weeks. <clears throat> I'm kind of curious at how your station uh, will, will your programming change to or adjust after the election? And if so, how? Uh, Tom, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, I'm not sure if the actual programming itself will change. I'm sure it will generate topics of conversation. Uh, we'll be probably looking for various guests to analyze and discuss how that impacts our community directly. Uh, the aftermath, um, some of the healing that might be taking place that is needed uh, goes back to the idea of our station being one that provides information and comfort 
as well. So trying to strike that balance after the election is something we definitely, you know, are looking to do. But in terms of changing any kind of programming, I don't see that actually happening. No programming that we have on now was designed specifically for the election. And so I don't see anything kind of happening afterwards. There could be, I mean, something could change. Uh, we've seen things change within the days as things go on. So, you know, I never say never with what can happen. We'll just, you know, we kind of run through the thing, kind of going back to, you know, what um, Harmon had said earlier, you know, even though you haven't been, you know, in radio before or anything, we always are kind of just kind of a little bit, one of the joys of is, you know, flying by the seat of our pants is kind of thing that kind of makes it fun. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Harmon, <laughs> how, how, uh, will anything change in two weeks on uh, WHGE? Well, it, it all depends. It, it depends on who wins the city council presidency. Uh, in, Del in Wilmington, there's uh, the overwhelming uh, majority uh, party is our Democrats, okay? And um, one of the candidates for city council president came on our political power hour. And he was so impressed with our small station that he said, uh, you know, more people need to know about this and, and I'm, I'm going to help get the word out. Well, this was uh, during the primary. He won the primary and he will be up for presidency on uh, November the 3rd. Now, if he wins, I'm sure that we, one of the sequels will be a weekly or bi-weekly, yeah, bi-weekly program featuring news about city council in Wilmington. What legislation they're considering, what it means to the average person, when it's going to be voted on, all kinds of stuff like that. So I'm really, uh, I think we have a bright uh, future in, in that regard. Daniel, how about at Radio Kata? Will uh, uh, anything change uh, with how you're addressing the community uh, uh, when after the election? I think I'm in the same boat as Tom. Most of our programs will change, except for Gata's on radio show. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions and concerns within our community of what's going to happen or what changes will occur. So more than likely, we'll be um, having like a little brainstorm session of what topics to talk about within the the Gata radio show. But the rest of the rest of the our program, I think it will be the same. Keish, how about, uh, is this something that you'll be addressing with the youth, uh, in the youth media, uh, with your youth, youth media program? Uh, well, we, we always stick to social justice topics, so that isn't like nothing um, being changed because regardless of the season, social justice like issues, um, whether that's gentrification, uh, LGBTQ rights, um, you name it, um, food insecurity. We we've been talking about it before. Like everything has gone down, so like I don't think talking about social justice is going to change. Although, um, I feel like there are bigger issues like that are um starting to come up, especially when um, especially um knowing that there's different um organizations that's taking lead and stuff like that. So I feel like that's something that might be talked about. But um, yeah, I feel like. Our radio show specific carousel has um, always talked about like current issues, so I don't think anything like that is going to change. So yeah. Well, uh, you kind of answered a little bit my next question. I wanted to ask each one of our panelists: uh, How is your station encouraging your audiences to engage in civic participation? I I think you've all kind of addressed this to a certain extent. But I'm going to ask that question directly. And, and Harmon, we'll start with you. Uh, I think you've already suggested ways that your station is engaging uh, or encouraging your audience to engage in civic participation. Maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. Well, uh, I'll uh, share just an idea or two that we're, uh, we've adopted. One is that for the uh, food giveaway, 
uh, there's a motto, bring what you can and take what you need. So we're encouraging people to not only come with their bags and, and seeking help uh, from us, but also to realize that they have a role to play in terms of helping others. There's food that they might have at home that you know they don't like, or that was given to them that they can't use, clothing that they may have grown out of, toys that they don't have kids to play with anymore. So we want uh, folks to realize, you know, that they, they can be not only the partakers, but the, but the givers. That's one thing. We struggle with helping, trying to get people to realize the station is here to be used by the community. So if you have an event, for example, that you were uh, something wholesome, you know, not a something that's unseemly, but uh, you can come on, you can either tell us or you can come on yourself. We've got, uh, we, we find that sometimes people are afraid, uh, you know, they haven't done it before. And we try to let them know, hey, listen, it's just, just come and talk just like you would from your own living room. So more and more people are coming by, they are sharing uh, information about events that their church or social club is is uh, sponsoring. And uh, I, I think uh, that's a good thing. We were able to involve some of the people in the voter registration. And with these elections coming up, uh, uh, we have been able to uh, try to, and we're probably not supposed to do this, but we have been a conduit so that people, if they want to donate, can uh, contact uh, the party or the politicians that they wish to support. Uh, Tom, how does G-Town Radio engage your, uh, or, or reach out to your audience to uh, try to foster civic engagement? Oh, a lot of it is through the, the various programs we have. I mean, we have shows that are very specific to, like, the climate change issues, um, you know, racial justice, uh, LGBTQ issues. And all of those shows usually will have guests at some point talking about ways to get involved. And just the various organizations in the area that are doing things, we try to give people a voice on our airwaves and various shows. If someone were to contact the station, you know, we can pipeline them into a show that they can appear on. We have shows like our morning show that came out of COVID at the Northwest Check-In that's on on Fridays at seven, that is sort of, we can always find a way to get that voice heard and ultimately engage our listenership on ways that you too can contribute to the community. and even you know becoming active in the radio station in, in some way be it from a producer aspect to helping create content to doing you know all the stuff that goes into a volunteer organization it's um there's many ways to get involved daniel how about radio kata you're muted sorry about that so within our programs, we always try to encourage people to come out and support in whatever they can. Uh, whether it be supporting our radio station and coming out and, you know, trying to do their own program or um, informing them things they can do to help out their own community. Or when we do episodes on climate change, we inform people on ways they could contribute to the environment. So we have many topics we, we talk about within already got them. And I feel as time passes, especially now, um, I'm, we're seeing the, the results a little bit more and I'm seeing more people reaching out to us and asking what ways they can also join and help out. So maybe as an extension of that question, uh, I'm kind of curious, how does each of your radio stations uh, measure your impact? You know, at a traditional radio station, it's about ratings. Uh, do each of your radio stations have a way that you uh, uh, measure that uh, uh, the impact that you're having in your community in terms of how, you know? Because we all need to we all need to be sustainable. Each of our radio stations. Uh, so again, this may be something that we've you've kind of answered before, but I'll ask that question 
very specifically. Tom, how about G-Town Radio? Oh, uh, that's the old question of how do you measure <laughs> your listenership. Uh, you know, there, we don't have a specific means. It's really uh, the old fashioned, you know, I like what you're doing, you know, high five. And you hear it through the community or just the simple fact you say, hey, I'm with G-Town Radio or, you know, I, I heard about you. That the fact that people know who you are when you say, hi, I'm with the radio station. They know who that radio station is and they know what it is. They may not necessarily be avid listeners, but they know we exist. So the simple fact that they know we who we are and exist and you're not getting that questionable look like who who are you uh, is right now the uh, that's probably the most important way of measurement because that's face to face and it's real people uh harman and i i have to say unfortunately we're coming close to the end of our uh hour so i'm just going to ask you to maybe to be a little bit brief about that do you does your station do you have a way of kind of measuring that impact yeah. It's a very, very informal and a very unscientific. Uh, we are trying to establish, though, a telephone system so that people can call in. Uh, we ha we're not there yet, but I think that might uh, provide a, a gauge of uh, who's listening and uh, that we, we don't have now. Right now, it's very informal, folks. I run into, hey, man, I didn't know you had a radio station and so forth. Let me quickly tell you this. Uh, on Sunday, the Black Lives Matter group here had a parade. And uh, when I heard it from the studio, I went out to my car and tracked it down and approached the leaders of this Black Lives uh, 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 demonstration and invited them to come on and do a show. And uh, they or they say, we will. And, and uh, so we, we do that. You know, if folks think you're worthwhile, they'll want to come on your radio station. If they think you're not worth a hoot, then they don't want to come. Daniel, in 30 seconds. So we usually measure it by phone calls, text messages, or if we have community meetings or events, we measure it by how many people actually show up or call in just to get more information about such events. Facebook too. You know, yeah, sometimes Facebook. people respond Social media. Uh, with Facebook comments. Well, you know, unfortunately I didn't get to the question that I kind of wanted to sum this whole hour up with is what ways could we better network? So we'll maybe we'll save that one for the next community regional, uh, community radio regional round up, round table. Uh, so I want to thank you all for participating in this. I found this discussion very, very interesting. Uh, I want to thank my panelists, Kay Statz, the associate producer of Hear Us Out, Youth Radio on WPPM 106.5 FM in Philadelphia, Harmon Carey, founder of WHGELP-FM uh, -E in Wilmington, Delaware, Daniel Arista, station assistant at Radio Kata, 102.5 FM in Bridgeton. And Tom Cassetta, the station manager at G-Town Radio, 92.9 uh, FM here in Philadelphia. Thank you all for participating. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us.